why on earth as women, why are we prepared to literally sacrifice our own health in the service of others to keep other people happy? And why is it that some people can live a life of incredible service and it doesn't deplete them? This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running for Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 212 of the Running for Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. If this is your first time of listening to a Running for Real podcast episode, I am excited you are here. Welcome. I hope you enjoy this episode and continue to stay on. If this is your 212th time, thank you for being such a loyal listener or any number along the way. I am just loving getting to know you. Many of you reach out to me every week and I really enjoy hearing more about your life, how things are going, what things have affected you. It's just one of my favorite parts of what I do. Now, last week we had an episode with Colleen Quigley, and I think many of you enjoyed that one. She is definitely a fan favorite, someone who many people admire and look up to. And I really appreciated about her that she is this elite runner that speaks her mind. We did not cover a lot of the usual topics with her. This was a totally new interview for her. And um, it was enjoyable to get to hear someone who isn't afraid to speak up for things that they believe in and Uh, also being positive at the same time. So really enjoyed that one. And if you haven't listened to it, go back and listen. Also on Monday, I had my episode with Corey Waltering for the World's Toughest Race Eco Challenge Fiji series. Corey is just a great guy. I loved his inspiration and all that he has done for the running community. So I hope you enjoyed that one as well. Now, on the note of previous episodes, I want to just mention an apology. Uh, I want to thank Kadisha for bringing this to my attention. But a few episodes or a few months ago now, uh, Jason Fitzgerald and I were talking about how things are all on Zoom and how things are very virtual now. And we mentioned about the BBC reporter who was interrupted by his children a few years ago and how it kind of went viral. And now that's a very common thing to have kids in the background. In that episode, we mentioned about the nanny coming into the the room. And although I didn't know any different at the time. Uh, I want to thank Kadisha for letting me know that it actually was the mother, not the nanny. And I think it was important for me to address this because that right there is systemic racism. That is something that myself and Jason and many other people would assume uh, that she was the nanny and we were wrong. So I do feel it is important for me to apologize for that because that is an assumption that I shouldn't have made. And it's Thank you to Kadisha for uh, highlighting that for me. Okay, so on to today's episode, I want to just let you know that there's a few things I talked about with Dr. Libby that are not going to be as she says, because I recorded this quite a few months in the past. She thought it was coming out very soon and it wasn't. So things I will have links to, uh, I will explain more about that at the end. But if she says coming up, I have, and it doesn't make sense, I will explain it in the outro. Yes. So Dr. Libby Weaver, this is not really a running episode, but it is another episode kind of like the Professor Meyer one that I really feel is needed for our community, particularly for the women listening, but also some of the men. This is all about the way that we fill our lives with all these things we have to do. We spend our lives in this this low level of stress. And I really enjoyed talking to this this expert. She has, is a 13 time bestselling author. She's a nutritional biochemist. She has helped hundreds of thousands of women all around the world to get, get their lives back in order. And not, I'm not saying this is going to be about removing stress. We're not going to take stress away from your life. There's still going to be all those things, or I guess I should say, we're not removing to do things or activities from your life. It's all about the perspective that you have, the little changes that you can make to make all those things you have to do feel so much better. This is going to be a really interesting episode, very different, but I think it's going to be very impactful for most people listening. I could not stop reading this book. You will hear who recommended it to me in the episode, and I am so glad I have a copy. I will be referring back to it 
often. So as I have already talked long enough, we are just going to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Momentus, and then we will be right to the episode with Dr. Libby Weaver. Thank you to Momentus for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. I introduced you to Momentus last week. I am a big fan of them. Their products are some of the things I have never used before, but I am enjoying them. I'm finding that they are helping, particularly for me as a recovering postpartum mother, but just because all of us right now are feeling very stressed, very stretched thin, maybe your nutrition isn't doing quite what you hope it would do and you are missing out. And this is a fantastic easy way to make up the the gaps in your diet. I am going to tell you a little bit more about the collagen today. That's something that I've really been enjoying mixing in smoothies. I probably will start mixing it in oatmeal once I switch to that as it's getting colder. I've also heard of people putting collagen peptides in their coffee, which I have not tried yet, but I've heard that lots of people say that it's a great way to to start your day with collagen to really help your body. So Momentous Collagen Peptides, this is this premium collagen supplement optimized for highly active individuals. That's you and that's me. The formula consists of 10 grams of high quality grass-fed collagen peptides, further optimized by the addition of 5.2 grams of Fortigel and 50 milligrams of vitamin C per serving. You can't complain about that. Fortigel is a clinically researched collagen peptide formula that was designed and tested to promote collagen synthesis in tendons and ligaments. So if you are someone who tends to struggle with Achilles issues or tendons that get inflamed, this is a great product for you to add to your life. If you are someone who deals with more of those, I was was a bone injury person when I was only athlete, but I know many, many people, including many of those of you who reach out to me often are people who struggle not so much with bone issues, but with tendons and ligaments. This is going to really help you. Vitamin C is a necessary cofactor in collagen synthesis and the consumption of vitamin C alongside collagen peptides has been shown to increase the effectiveness of collagen supplements. You can use momentous collagen peptides for daily long-term joint health, resilience against injury, and a faster return to running. The most popular ways you could use it are, as I said, smoothie or in your morning coffee. A lot of people love that. It mixes in really easily, totally unflavored. And just on that note, many products claim to be unflavored, but you definitely can taste the strong scent of their source. I have experienced that with other collagen products that I've used in the past, but not with Momentus. It is NSF certified for sport, which is absolutely crucial for athlete supplements. And here's the best bit. I can tell you, you can get 15% off your order when you sign up for a subscription by using code TINA. You can get 15% off at livemomentous.com. That's livemomentous.com. Use code TINA. You will get 15% off when you sign up for a subscription. You can cancel at any time. This is a great product. Check out their collagen and let me know how you get on with it. Dr. Libby, I am honoured, excited and just thrilled that you are here today. Thank you so much for joining me on the Running For Real podcast. Oh, Tina, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. This is going to be great. And I have to say, I don't know how many of my audience members would have heard of you other than I cannot believe I'm talking to you after Anna Frost had been mentioning that she reads your book, Rushing Women's Syndrome, uh, Rushing Woman's Syndrome, uh, I think she said she reads it every year to remind herself. Um, And so I was really intrigued because I look up to Anna and I thought, I've got to check this out. And then when I read it, I was like, why isn't everyone talking about this book? Um, It is uh, just been such a game changer. And I see why she says that now. So you're not just an author of Refreshing Woman's Syndrome. You are a 13 times bestselling author, although maybe it's even more since you updated that. Is it still 13? (laughs) It's still 13, yes. Okay. Still pretty impressive. Um, you are a nutritional biochemist and uh, just have changed hundreds of thousands. I mean, maybe you could even branch into millions by now. I'm not sure you can correct me of women with just getting their life back, with getting their health back and not in the way that they might expect. So we're going to primarily focus on rushing woman's syndrome today. But if there's other things that you feel apply from your other books, I'd love for you to to mention those as well, because my audience, uh, many of them definitely love to read. So to begin, I want to hear, you know, for some to to focus on something so specific with regards to helping women with their health, but beyond just the, you need to eat better, you need to sleep more, you need to, you know, do the, you take this drug. 
when was the moment that you realized you needed to do something and this was your passionate area that you wanted to go into beyond just what is typically prescribed? It was 2011 and I'd been working in private practice for over a decade, seeing patients one-on-one, primarily women. And I had just noticed such an enormous shift in women's health Uh, in the way they were handling life, if you like, Mm -hmm. uh, from 10 years prior that I wanted to delve deeper into it. So when women would walk through the door of my practice originally, you know, they'd just come with whatever they wanted to work on. And I started to notice the intensity with which women were turning up. And then when I would delve in and ask them questions, do you get headaches? Often they'd say yes. When we talk about their digestive system, there were all sorts of challenges, whether it was Uh, an irritable bowel type syndrome picture or just constant bloating or unpredictable bowel patterns, or it was challenges with their reproductive cycle. So might've been really debilitating periods or their periods had disappeared, or they might've been going through a really challenging transition with menopause. The thyroid challenges I was seeing were were becoming uh, more frequent in my patients. So, and please know too, obviously the people who are attracted to my work are often people who are looking for answers. I know no one sort of goes looking for information about their health when they feel fantastic. So I know I'm seeing a skewed group of the population, but I was just seeing this whole big picture of challenges with thyroid, digestion, uh, the reproductive system, hormones, and then the ripple effect of all of that. And so I wanted to dig into that. And so I wrote a book in 2011 called Rushing Woman Syndrome. And I appreciate the kind words you've said about that. And I bring to life in that body of work, the three pillars of my work, which is the biochemical, the nutritional, and the emotional. So I've essentially looked at the production of stress hormones in women what those stress hormones do, so that's sort of the biochemistry, then the, the, the ripple effect of those stress hormones, so the way stress hormones interfere with sex hormone production, with thyroid function, with gut function. Mm-hmm. Then I looked at the nutritional side of things and then the emotional side of things, which is where I get women to ponder the question, why do we do what we do even though we know what we know? So in Rushing Woman Syndrome, I brought those three pillars to life and looked at looked at rushing and looked at essentially the stress response through those three lenses. Yes. And I think I I love the way that in the book, you break it down. You're at the beginning, you kind of ask questions. Do you do this? Do you do this? And I'm willing to bet most of my listeners will being runners who are very type A primarily, mostly women. So men, this may or may not apply to you, but um, as it is mostly women um, in the audience here, but the very driven people and reading down this list, I was reading check. Yep. 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 And I, I can see it in people around me too. So I knew this was going to apply. And, um, I want to talk to you a bit later about kind of my journey and how I can just see such a drastic shift in me doing essentially what you recommend in this book without having the book to actually have guided me. And um, I think this you're going to be able to help so many people by reading this book. But I want to firstly start by going a bit deeper into one of the premises of the book is kind of that women don't trust their body, that we have kind of lost that ability to understand what our body is saying. So tell me and the listeners, what, what does that mean by that, that women feel betrayed by their bodies? So I think at, unfortunately, at at younger and younger ages, women become aware of their physical shape and size. And I think there are very few women who don't start to fiddle with what they're eating at a particular point to try to either maintain where they're at or change where they're at. So I think a big part of it starts with us changing um, the amount of food we're having or the types of food we're having, and we become somewhat body conscious And if you, it sort of depends on the era where you grew up, but if you grew up with the calorie equation running your thinking, in other words, as long as you eat fewer calories than you burn off with your activities, then your body size should get smaller. If you've grown up with that, with that mentality and believing that that's the only thing that influences body shape and size, you soon, soon learn when you fiddle with your calories that it doesn't work for most people and that you can restrict calories and exercise more and it doesn't necessarily change your body or for some women when they make those changes their body size actually increases and it's very perplexing so that's when I first wrote those words a lot of women feel like their body betrays them that's where it stemmed from it was 
that, that they'd played with their food and not necessarily gotten the outcomes they were that they anticipated they would get. Yeah. So, and it was certainly my experience with my patients very early on, and my own experience was we I went with the with what I was witnessing with that and women not getting the results that they were expecting from fiddling with their calories. That was what actually led me to go back to my geeky biochemistry textbooks with the question in my mind: What leads the human body to get the message to burn fat? And what leads the body to get the message to store fat? And I put those answers into the first book I wrote, which was Accidentally Overweight. And there are actually nine factors, and they involve things like stress hormones, sex hormones, our gut bacteria, insulin, thyroid function, emotions play a role. So there are there are nine factors in total. So until we come to understand the factors that are at play for us, we often feel like our body betrays us because when you just fiddle with your food and you don't get the outcomes, you won't necessarily realize that, for example, you might be making a lot of cortisol, one of our long-term stress hormones that says to the body, break muscle down, hang on to body fat, and no amount of calorie restriction is going to override that survival mechanism, that survival Mm -hmm. message. So that was the first part of that sense I had that women really felt like their body betrayed them. And that then led me to I guess, really try to bring forth in my work the idea that our body is essentially our best friend. It's a vehicle of communication, but it doesn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. And so it lets us know, it gives us feedback via symptoms. And when there's something going on with our body that's uncomfortable or frustrating, or it makes us really sad, or or things aren't working as well as they once did, that's information. And it's all just feedback about our choices and when the symptoms are uncomfortable or or something we want to change, it's usually asking us to make changes in the way we eat, drink, move, think, breathe, believe or perceive or sometimes it's a number of those areas and if you can just, if we can start to shift our thinking to our body is this most extraordinary, I call it an earth suit quite often Yeah, (laughs) and then allows us to live this extraordinary life uh, and we want to do everything we can to look after it and maintain its functionality for as long as possible because so many people I think live too short and die too long. Mm -hmm. A lot of people spend not enough time in their life with a fully functional body with great energy uh, and and, and it's all just feedback. So that's the essence behind I think that feeling that our body betrays us when it's not. It's our best friend and it's always trying to wake us up to help us create our best level of health. Yes, I and I just I resonated so much with that. I mean, my audience knows this, but the reason my podcast business kind of took off was I had no I didn't have a period for 9 years mm. and I was a professional runner, but I all I all I kept getting was it's the running, it's the running, it's the running from doctors. But then I tried all the diet stuff to change tweak my diet to get it to come back. Nothing was working. Nothing was working. Meanwhile, I was not really sleeping. I was, um, restricting my calories, although would fight to the death saying that I wasn't. And it was only when I finally reached a point of, you know what, I'm going to do what I can. And I stopped running. I ate what I wanted. And I think one of the keys, I rested my mind and my body. I sat on the couch and I said, you know what, I'm prepared for the long haul with this road. Doesn't matter how long it takes me. Doesn't matter what I have to do. I'm going to do it. Women reaching out to me almost on a daily basis saying, you know, you've inspired me. Thank you so much. But, you know, ha- uh, how many calories do you think I should be eating right now to get it back? And I said, the only way you're going to get yourself over that edge to where your health comes back is when you finally let go of this feeling that your body has to hit a certain number or look a certain way. It's only when you give yourself that freedom of saying, I trust you body. I'm going to let you figure it out that it actually happens. And not everyone listening is going to be dealing with that. Um, but I want to dive into this a bit deeper into runners feel, um, they know they have this physical stress on their body all the time and they understand that. And I know you're not the, the hugest fan of running, and I'm not saying that to to make everyone, you know, <laughs> uh, send an angry crowd at you or anything. But and because you, you could clearly say in the book that if you if you love to run, then you know, go, by all means, go for it. Just make sure you're supporting your body with antioxidants. But people know that running is a physical is a stress on their body. 
But then they often people don't understand the other stresses that the rest of their life can have. Can, so can mm. you explain to us the, the additional stresses in mm. your life of the, the high maintenance, the type A, the, uh, the little things that people don't account for, that low level of anxiety, how that can really affect your body? Absolutely. And uh, so... Sorry, that was so much information. No, no, it's brilliant. It's so brilliant. And it's all about connecting with people and helping people and giving people the information they need to, to, to have, you know, a really, a really healthy body. So no, it's brilliant. So because humans have been on the planet for a couple of hundred thousand years and for all of that history, whenever we made stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol, it was nearly always, well, always historically because of a physical threat to our life. Whereas in the most recent years, we now make stress hormones for primarily psychological reasons. Mm -hmm. We are medically relatively safe, so there's not the tiger, tiger coming out of the jungle about to threaten our life. So that's usually not what a physical stress is, rarely what leads to our stress hormone production now. It's primarily psychological stress. So I'll run through the, the things in our life that can lead to stress hormone production because it's essentially stress hormones that put that load onto the body. So some people are going to want to block their ears right now because you're not going to like this little bit. Yeah. But caffeine leads the human body to make adrenaline. And what, what happens is when we consume caffeine from any source, it binds to what are called the adenosine receptors in the brain. And when caffeine binds to those receptors in the brain, it sends a message to the adrenal glands, which sit on top of our kidneys, to produce adrenaline. So that's just the biological response of the consumption of caffeine. And I'm not anti-caffeine at all. I just want people to be aware that adrenaline is the hormone behind anxious feelings. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes one of the things we can change is to have fewer um, moments where we consume caffeine. We, we can have less caffeine in our day. And that can help us to feel far more comfortable and, and settle some of those anxious feelings down. People are often astonished at the shift that happens just with having less coffee. Mm -hmm. Some people do really well if they take a break from it and then just go back to having one a day if they really love it, for example. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. caffeine is something we can play with. So that's the first thing. The second thing that leads to adrenaline production in modern times is our perception of pressure and urgency. Mm -hmm. And I choose that word perception with real purpose because we forget that we get to choose how we see each day. Now, I'm not saying for a, for a second that life isn't busy, that life might not be chock-a-block full, that we might, I'm not saying we don't have a lot of responsibilities, that we don't, that we carry a load, absolutely. But whether that is stressful or not is our choice in how we see it. And I'll give you a couple of, couple of examples of that. Not so long ago, I was the guest speaker for the Hereditary Breast and Ovarian Cancer Society at their national conference. So that room was either filled with women who had been told they had the gene for breast and or ovarian cancer, or they had one of those cancers, or they were cancer thrivers. So they had once had that cancer and now they were free of it. And after I, when, when the world was different and you could speak live, <laughs> yeah. it was an actual, uh, people would, I would answer people's questions after I spoke. And then quite often I would have questions of my own. It's one of the ways I continue to learn. And so the women that day approached me individually not, not as a collective group, all individually. And, and many of them shared with me what they were going through. So some of them had an unknown prognosis. Others had a poor prognosis. Uh, some of them had had to stop work because they were suffering so much with their treatment. So they had financial challenges. For some of them, their marriages had broken down, challenges with teenage children, just on and on the list went. So in other words, they were facing a lot of life's truly big, tough things all at once, including some uncertainty around their own mortality. Mm -hmm. And that day when I asked those women if they felt like they were living with a lot of stress and pressure and urgency, every single one of them said no. And the essence of what they communicated back to me was that they just felt so privileged to still be alive. So we don't want it to be some kind of health crisis that wakes us up to the extraordinary gift that life is, even though it is immensely challenging, particularly for a lot of people at the moment. In amongst all the challenges is this extraordinary beauty and, and these extraordinary gifts. So we, so perceptions of pressure and urgency, I think, are we, we create those. And another body of work I think that's very helpful in, in really bringing that home to us is the work of uh, a man called Viktor Frankl. So 
Uh, he was uh, captured by Nazis and taken to a concentration camp along with all the members of his family. He watched all the members of his family be tortured and murdered in front of him, including his pregnant wife. Oh. And he went on and wrote a book, uh, a number of books, but one of his books, Man's Search for Meaning, he, it, despite witnessing and being part of such atrocity, such genuine trauma, he still had the presence of mind to share with us that between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies every single ounce of our growth and our freedom. So in other words, when something happens, there is a split second where we get to choose how we respond to that. And that is up to us. And that doesn't mean that, you know, we're not to respond with stress sometimes, of course, but I think when we can catch ourselves in our response, it helps to keep things in perspective. And then the final thing I'd say to one of the big things that we can change when it comes to our stress hormone production is in the last book I wrote, it's called The Invisible Load. And I talk in that book about what I call forward words. And they are the traits that we need other people to see us as. Mm. So I would say to, I used to say to my patients, tell me the way you need other people to see you. And it's a really helpful exercise to do. Just get pen and paper, ask yourself the question, how do I need other people to see me? And quite often when you're a rushing woman, the first couple of words that come out onto the paper are kind, thoughtful, selfless. They're very common. Mm -hmm. And then you might go on to be intelligent, independent, confident, creative. Perfect is another massive one for rushing women. People actually say the word perfect. It takes about, after they've done about a hundred other words, they finally get to that and oh. then they cry. And that's yeah. when they cry yeah. <laughs> because then you've got to go down that rabbit hole of, mm. okay, now tell me what is that to you? So to be seen as perfect, what is that to you? And because that's different for everybody, yeah. but it's, it's so powerful to, to hunt for this. So you capture all your words on your bit of paper about how you need other people to see you. And if you, if perfect comes out, dig into that and get the detail of that as well on what perfect looks like for you. And then the next time you're stressed, pause and consider if you are perceiving that someone is seeing you in a way that is the opposite to one of your borrowed words. Mm. And just about Every time, I want to say every time, but I try not to speak in extremes, but, but almost every time the answer will be yes. So because, for example, let's say in these current times, a lot of people are working from home and let's say a colleague rings you up and says, where's that work? I needed it yesterday. So we don't hear what someone says. We hear what we think they meant. Mm -hmm. So when someone says, where's the work? Sure. You've heard their request for the work, but what you also usually hear in inverted commas is that they think you're inefficient or lazy or not good at your job. So in other words, you perceive that they are seeing you in a disapproving way, but we often don't notice that that's what's going on. Yeah. And you just then end up in this stress response and you just think you're stressed because your colleagues asked you for some work that's not done yet. But if you didn't perceive their dis if you didn't make it's a story you made up, the colleague didn't ring you up and go, Oh my goodness, you're so lazy. You're so bad at your job. <laughs> they didn't say any of that. They just said, where's the work? Yeah. And if you didn't pass all of that judgment about yourself and make it all, make this, make the story up about the way they're perceiving you, it wouldn't be stressful. You'd just say, oh, I'm sorry, I haven't got it to you yet. I've got a lot on my plate. I'll get to it as soon as I can. <laughs> but it's because we, we we don't want to be seen in any kind of disapproving way by others. Mm -hmm. that that's what leads us, leads that situation to be stressful. And we do that all day, every day. Yes. So one of the way, So one of the ways we can start to produce fewer stress hormones is to become so aware of the meanings we create and the perceptions we create about how we perceive others see us. It's so powerful when you bring that to action in your life. 
Thank you to Trek Smith for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. Now you should know by now, if you don't already, Trek Smith is a Boston-based brand led by a group of runners who are committed to making classically stylish, cutting edge apparel. I have been running in these clothes all year and I absolutely love them. And guess what? It is now the season that I can wear one of my favorite items, which is the Brighton base layer. This is a soft, lightweight base layer made from 52% wool, 28% nylon, 20% polyester. It's sewn together seamlessly to prevent any chance of chafing against your skin. And I can absolutely attest to that. It has a tighter knit on the arm, arms for warmth with a loosened knit in the core where you're going to heat up as the run goes on. We all know how it can be chilly when we start, but then we warm up as we go and it's a bit looser to let some of the air flow through. This is a perennial bestseller. This Brighton base tank has been featured all over the world as one of the, the best long sleeves on the market and it absolutely is. It is my favorite thing that Tracksmith wears. I think it's probably my favorite thing. Yes, I think it is my favorite absolutely love it. And Tracksmith really puts in the effort to go above and beyond when it comes to design. They design all their products to solve the kind of problems that runners face, whether it's a breathable long sleeve that can be reworn without washing. And yes, I can do that too. Or whether it's the perfect short for your long run with room for your keys, phone and fuel, Tracksmith designers sweat the details so you don't have to. I've been telling you about Tracksmith for months now. I absolutely love them. But beyond just the clothes, it is so important to find a brand who who speaks up about things that are important, not only to them as a brand, but to us in the running world. And I really admire the way that Tracksmith has changed things and changed their approach and really speaks up. They want to be inclusive. They want to be diverse. They want to make sure they stand up for what is right in this world. And that is very, very admirable. So I want to thank Tracksmith for doing that. Now, Long story short, to give you my coupon code, which you can now use code TINA15, that's code TINA15 to get $15 off your order of $75 or more by going to tracksmith.com. You can also go to tinamuir.com forward slash tracksmith and there'll be lots of links there to my favorite items, including that Brighton base tank, but also the other items that I like if you aren't in the market for a long sleeve. This brand really cares about the community, cares about running. You just need to follow them on social media to see this. They are one of a kind. I'm so proud to be working with them. And yeah, go get $15 off your order of 75 or more by using code TINA15 at checkout. So one of the ways we can start to produce fewer stress hormones is to become so aware of the meanings we create and the perceptions we create about how we perceive others see us. It's so powerful when you bring that to action in your life. Yes. And actually I've been uh, meditating for, uh, for the first time in my life, actually like sticking to it for the last two or three months. And yeah, I'm starting to see what you talked about that split second where you get to, you kind of are like, huh, I wonder why I thought that rather than, you know, kind of berating yourself or, or letting things go, um, go to a point where you get angry with yourself for letting them get that far. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've definitely seen so much of that. And, and like you said, it is so powerful once you realize it, or even behaviors that you've done your whole life that, you know, afterwards, you're like, why do I do that? But instead of saying, why do I do that? Saying, huh, I wonder why, why I do that. And then yeah. And then it peels back until you can do it just in the moment before. So I love hearing you say that because I'm definitely seeing it right now. And I know meditation is one of the things you recommend, but just to dig in more to the, um, the kind of being in it, the, the way that women treat themselves uh, a little bit more. So in uh, rushing women syndrome, you talk about women living, what you've been saying, this perception, they have to be all things to all people so they will never, ever be rejected. And then later on, you go to say, uh, fit everything in to do all they have to do. So they never, ever let anyone down and feel rejected. Tell us about what you mean by that, like feeling rejected. If someone's saying, well, I don't I don't worry about feeling rejected. Could you explain what you meant by that? Essentially, it's being disapproved of. So I think I try to get everything back to its origin. I try to get to the heart of absolutely everything (laughs) in any situation I'm dealing with, with someone in listening to their stories. And so at the heart, and it it sounds really hippie la la, (laughs) but at the heart, at the heart of absolutely everything is love. Yeah. And so if we sort of come back from that a little bit, 
that's why I, I, when I describe that, because it's like, why on earth as women, why are we prepared to literally sacrifice our own health in the service of others to keep other people happy? Mm -hmm. And why is it that some people can live a life of massive contribution, a life of incredible service, and it doesn't deplete them? And that's where I pulled it apart into when you do something out of duty, it depletes you. Whereas if you do something because you feel called to act on it, it is energizing, even though your life might be incredibly full and overflowing with tasks. When it's something that you feel really genuinely called to do, you get energy from it. Whereas when you're doing it out of duty or because you're worried that someone will think less of you, uh, then that, then that's depleting. So when I, when I made that, when I wrote rushing woman syndrome and said, we ultimately do it so that we're never rejected. It's so that we're never, what I mean by that is so that we're never seen in an unfavorable light so that we're never seen as being selfish or unkind or thoughtless or basically the opposite to our forward words that I just touched on. And it's just that on the surface, I mean, please don't get me wrong too with this. If we if we stop helping others, the world's going to fall apart. So I'm yeah. all about a sense of I'm all about fostering community and 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 demonstrating kindness to others. I will, however, say that there are people who are able to say no when they need to. Yeah. So if you've got four thousand things already on your plate, and someone says, "Oh, can you help me with this?" and every bone in your body is screaming, "Say no, please say no," and then what comes out of your mouth is, "Sure, I'll help you." Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm and you really struggle to say no, on the surface that looks really good. But if you peel back the layers on that, when you wanted to say no because your priorities and your value systems are, let's say, more about focusing on your own immediate family, you might have ageing parents who need your care and attention, uh, there's enough on your plate with working from home, with homeschooling, uh, you know, all of that, and then here you are saying yes to do something that's not really a priority for you. It's to, to help, to, to help someone else. Essentially there's, if you then regret saying yes, because you wanted to say no, you don't judge yourself and berate yourself. Why did I do that? You go, Oh, I'm really curious about why I did that. Why did I say yes? When I really wanted to say no, if you bring curiosity to situations, there's always an opportunity to learn. And that's how we can perhaps not repeat it all in the future. So essentially we're worried when, when you say yes, when you really meant no, you're worried about what that person would think of you. But if you flip it around and you think, okay, if I went to someone and said, could you please help me with this? And they said, oh, look, sorry, I'm drowning in tasks. I'd love to help you, but I can't right now. What are you going to do to that person? Are you going to say, oh, well, that's it. Our friendship's over. Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. you're not going to do that, usually you'll say, oh my goodness, could I help you if you're drowning in tasks? Is there anything I can do? You're not going to judge them for saying no. But I think as rushing women, we get really concerned if we say no, that they'll think that we're the opposite to one of those forward words. Yeah. So it's, um, it's fascinating when you just start to peel back the layers on, on, on our behavior. So I want to go deeper into that. But one question that came up when you were saying that, what is the difference between that saying no to think to tasks and let's say, you know, everyone's feeling very busy right now and an opportunity might come up to talk to a friend or to be involved in a group chat or something that, you know, deep down is going to make you feel so good. Every time you talk to this person, you walk away feeling great or you meet this group and you feel confident and happy and, and just live, like full up. But then in the moment you're, it kind of is like, oh, like I, I kind of hope they cancel so I don't have to go. Or there's always that uh, like urge to say no or to find an excuse, even though you know it is actually going to energize you. Is there anything behind that in terms of explanation of, of why? Because I know many women do that and, and it kind of is a bit of a joke, isn't it? Like I just want everyone to cancel so I can go home and watch TV. Can you explain <laughs> that kind of phenomenon a bit? Uh, so I think if you've said yes, because you know, it's good for your soul, it's good for your energy, it's good for your mental health. If you've said yes to a group chat that you know is supportive of you, I think the biggest reason when that, when the time then comes around for that appointment, for that connection, 
it's often because we're we're spent. Our day has yeah. already been done meeting the needs of other people usually quite often. So by the time that comes around, your preference is to be quiet <laughs> and um and just retreat into yourself rather than continue to sort of be extroverted and 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 chat away. So um it's a fine line, I think, between following through and then acting on that thing. If if it is going to support you, I think it's really healthy to follow through with that. Uh, and it's sometimes more about looking at what you're doing through the day that's leading you to that mm. place where you are absolutely spent. And is there anything that can change then? It's it's very difficult uh, to change things when children are very young, for example, because when they're very young, they need us. Yeah. And there's, you know, when I, when I talk about sleep in my work, obviously we can't fight our biological requirement for sleep. We must get adults need between seven and nine hours a night. And yet a lot of people fight that, that biological requirement. However, there are some situations where obviously sleep is disrupted because little humans Mm. need a carer in the night. And the only way we can sort of process that in our mind is to think, well, they're young for such a relatively short amount of time in their life and in my life, and this won't last forever. So, you know, you've just got to, you do have to grin and bear it across those years. So it is when I say sometimes there are things in our day we can adjust so that we can be part of a group chat, like you're suggesting, that's very supportive of our energy and our mental health. There are definitely times in our life where we can't change what we're doing through the day because little humans need us. Mm -hmm. Whereas once they're a bit older or uh, if you don't have a family situation like that, then there might be things that are movable in your day so that you can do some things that are really supportive of your health then like you're suggesting with this group chat thing. Yeah. Thank you. And then you mentioned there about, uh, having young kids and I, myself, as we're recording this, have a three month old and a two year old. So I definitely understand that part, but I have been getting up at 5am to, to get a run in or to get some kind of exercise in and to get, uh, to do some meditation, do some journaling, some things that I feel help me to kind of take on the day. But that obviously does cut into some sleep. And for 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 women listening who say, okay, I can, I've either got the choice of sleep, or I do have children who are at home, uh, virtual learning. I do have a full time job. I those are non negotiables. So my only time is to get up early or to stay up, you know, nine till eleven and do it. Then, what would be your suggestion? Is it worth giving up that time, kind of? It essentially continuing into the rushing woman syndrome to get some me time, or would you say it's almost better to, to get the res- restoration and the sleep and step away from those things? It's highly individual, Tina. Mm-hmm. So there are some, some people, if they are really depleted, so their cortisol level is low, they've got a lot of inflammation, uh, they're very stiff, their thyroid function might be starting to decrease. So if you're really at the very depleted end of of the energy spectrum, then the sleep is is the most critical thing because that's what's going to help restore your energy and help restore so much about your health. Whereas if you have pretty good energy uh, and you feel that the day is just so jam-packed with meeting the needs of others, then getting up an hour before everybody else uh, to do things that fill your soul, mm-hmm. that do things that are good for your physical body. So whatever it, whatever you feel you need, uh, I think it can really help to create better energy. It can help to create a sense of spaciousness in your mind so it doesn't change everything that's on your plate for the day ahead, but it can that time to yourself in the morning I think can change how you're able to show up yeah. for those things. For sure. So, but it's, high, it's highly variable. But I've definitely... Uh, worked with people who they need to sleep more, and but but you want to get them back to a place of improved health so that they can have that space in the morning when they've got to meet the needs of everybody else across the day. Hi friends, today I want to tell you about our black owned business feature of the week, which is Tawa Threads. And Tawa Threads reflect the natural beauty, contours and silhouettes of the lands we love to wander. Tower Thread styles and bold exploratory colours seek to elevate underrepresented communities by giving proceeds back to organisations who implement inclusive outdoor experiences. I love that. 
Designs include an assortment of apparel, home decor that are uniquely hand printed, providing each print with its own unique character. Love it. You can feel free to use my discount code, which is run with tower 10 at checkout when you are purchasing your product. That is run with tower 10, R-U-N-W-I-T-H-T-A-W-A-10 at checkout when you are purchasing your product. You can find out more by checking out Tower Threads on their website by going to T-A-W-A-T-H-R-E-A-D-S, TowerThreads.com. You can find out more. You can see their cool design. You can see about the partners they work with. You can learn about the advocates. You can be an advocate and shop by purchasing some of these products. They are just a wonderful company to be supporting a black owned business. I've got to know Tabria a little bit and I love her and I think I'm very excited to, to share Tower Threads with you. So you can use code RUNWITHTOWER10 at towerthreads.com and go support this black owned business. I've definitely worked with people who they need to sleep more and, but, but you want to get them back to a place of improved health so that they can have that space in the morning when they've got to meet the needs of everybody else across the day. Okay. And then related to that. So, you know, let's say someone has a a few minutes in the day, the child is distracted playing with something or on a, on a zoom call, they're engaged. They have a few minutes between meetings at work grab the phone for social media and say, I just want to escape for a minute, you know, and I'll tell myself that maybe I'll be inspired or I want to see what friends and family are doing. What would you say based on your experience, what you've learned living in this social media world or even checking email? Is that a good use of your time to, I mean, we know the answer that there's always better things you can do than use social media, but what about for people who use it as an escape? It, would you say that's a good escape mechanism? Uh, I'd firstly ask someone why they felt like they wanted to escape from their life. <laughs> um, and I, so much of what is supportive of someone's health, I think it comes down to understanding our values. Mm. So when someone says to me, oh, I don't have time for that, so they might say, I might be encouraging them to cook dinner more regularly rather than buy takeaway. And they might say, Oh, I don't have time for that. What, when, when we say we don't have time for something, what we're really saying is that's not a priority for me or that's not a priority for me at this point in my life. It's along those lines. And so when you use the more truthful words in the example I'm giving, I don't have time to cook dinner what you're really saying is cooking dinner is just not a priority for me right now. You have to check in with yourself and see if you're comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And and there are definitely times in that you might have a parent who is really, really sick and you have got to be there for them all the time. And so the last thing on your mind is cooking dinner for yourself. You know, you're, you're present with them. You're, you're helping them. You're doing everything to support them. Takeaway might be the best thing, you know, while you're focused on, on a really sick, you know, helping a really sick parent, for example. But if it's, if there's nothing sort of out of the ordinary happening, it's just everyday life, even if that's really chaotic, it, it's, you know, and you're saying, I don't have time to cook dinner more often. It's really hard to have great health if you're not having a decent amount of home cooked meals. Yeah. So you've got to see if you're comfortable with that. And then that all comes back to our, all of this comes back to our values. I think one of the most powerful things we can do when it comes to our health and our our time management and the way we perceive stress is to actually do an exercise in our values. And I don't mean ethical preferences like patience or loyalty. I'm not talking about those things. When I talk about values, I'm talking about what our life demonstrates we value. So our in, in this context, I'm talking about yeah, the way we live our life shows us our priorities. What are you prepared to spend your time on, spend your money on? What do you think about when there's nothing else happening? Uh, all of those things show you your values. And so when someone says, oh, you know, I've got five minutes between meetings and I want to check social media, if someone values nature, uh, which might be part of their health, mm they're not even going to think of checking social media. They're going to go outside between their meetings and look at the sky or look at the grass or just take some breaths of fresh air outside or whatever it, 
you know, whatever it is. It's, so it's, I think so many of our choices come back to our values. And if we've never explored our values, then things that are of a, a lower priority will jump into those places and you get to the end of the day, not feeling very fulfilled. And that's not to diss social media. I know it's how some families stay in touch. I'm not putting it down for a second. It, it definitely helps some people with connectivity. But when someone's saying, oh, I just want to escape for a minute, I 100% understand that. And by all means, of course, go for it. But it could also, that space could be filled with social media on two of those occasions across the day. And then the other three of those little spaces could be filled with something that is more meaningful to you. Yes. And so related to that, if someone feels that, especially right now, there's there's a lot of, of things we can't control, the stresses that are always going to be that are going to be around for a while. That you, like you said, you can choose whether they affect you or not. Um, things like uh, the climate emergency, things like the um, conversations about systemic racism that are going on, those things are going to be around. But then, someone. So they know that going to check social media or particularly somewhere like Twitter is not going to make them feel very good because they're going to see things and it's going to add in more of this cortisol that you've been talking about. But then they find their to-do list is so overwhelmingly long that it is almost impossible. Like, I just don't even know where to begin. I just need a few moments to, I don't know, just browse and and look online at, at shopping or something like that. Uh, what would you say that's an underlying thing going on if someone feel like they have this massive list going on yet they can't get started on any of it? Uh, I would just give yourself permission to be the way you are right now. So if I, I think you see, you would, I would see that I just want to browse shopping on online. I would see that as this person needs some help, this, not as in like they need. If they can't face their to-do list, you know, what can we change with that? Is are they someone who doesn't have access to any help or support? So how can we set them up with some? Or is it that they they might be living with other family members, but they just don't want to ask for help? A lot of women have a statement: "If I don't do it, it won't get done." Yeah, and so they'd rather just do it themselves than ask other people to get the groceries or tidy the kitchen or whatever it is. They just would rather do it themselves. So if you feel really overwhelmed with a to-do list, yeah, so is is, is some help and support needed? Uh, and, and if you don't have access to that, it's obviously very important that that changes, uh, even if it's a phone call to a support service so that you can have a chat about things and, you know, see what's what might be behind the scenes there. But I would also, on the flip side of all of that, if it's just, oh, my goodness, I am really tired and I've just got back-to-back -back meetings and then tonight I've got all this, you know, family stuff I, I want to attend to. So just give yourself permission to do what you want in that five-minute break and don't judge yourself if you want to have a browse online. I think um, the judgment we pass on ourselves sometimes is far yeah. worse for us than any of our choices. And I used to say that about biscuits because so many of my patients over the years would say to me oh if I eat one biscuit I'll eat the whole packet yeah and which is a cookie for anyone listening sorry <laughs> I, I just because my uh audience is primarily American I'm just saying it's yeah. a cookie pardon? <laughs> cookie <laughs> not not a, uh, not a biscuit in America is like a like a scone almost so um just wanted to so clarify thank you <laughs> <laughs> um and so it's quite often, you know, if you if you make some poor quality food choices, the judgment that we pass on ourselves for making those choices is far worse than yeah. the lousy food choices. And it's actually the judgment that then leads us to treat ourselves in other lousy ways. You know, you go back the next day for more cookies or um, you're really mean to yourself with your thoughts and that then disrupts your sleep or and on and on it goes. Yes. And I would love to then go into, as this relates well, you mentioned in the book about phrases and statements heard in childhood, such as don't be so full of yourself, which I definitely remember hearing. And people don't like that. And how that becomes ingrained in you uh, for this belief that if I want to be loved and accepted, I need to dull and dim and dumb myself down. That's something you said there. And then you also talked about this whole good girl 
the feeling that we have that we need to be viewed as a good girl that was ingrained in us as children and I've read a lot about this particularly having two daughters I'm very sensitive to it so I'd love for you kind of to crack that open for people who have never really thought about what that means what was it what's been ingrained in us since childhood and what why we're always trying to be good girls so I think most of us are raised by really well-intentioned adults to be good girls and to put the needs of others ahead of our own. That's essentially very altruistic mm-hmm. and that's looked upon, I think altruism is looked upon very favourably in our society at the moment. And uh, so, yeah, when, when we're raised to be good girls, we often then try to continue that behaviour and it's you want to be yourself, you want to be your authentic self, you want to be truthful, not good. But it usually takes, uh, it often takes a health crisis or a big relationship change for you to, I think, for us to get that insight. So what I mean by that is when a, when a human baby is first, when we're born, an adult has to meet our needs. They have to give us food, clothing and shelter so that we can literally survive, whereas other animals from the moment they're born, they can survive on their own. Mm-hmm. But, but because humans need the care, baby humans need the care of an adult, we subconsciously learn that to literally survive, to actually stay alive, we have to maintain the favour of the people caring for us. And we start to subconsciously learn through their facial expressions, what they say, what they don't say, changes in essentially changes in their mood. When we're very, very little, we are, from an emotional maturation perspective, egocentric. Some people never change, sadly. But when we're little, we're supposed to be egocentric. And all that means is you think that the way people are in the world is because of you. So when they're happy, you think it's because of you. When they're unhappy, same thing. So when we're very, very young, we start to work out that to have our food, clothing and shelter needs met so that we can actually survive, we've got to, yes, maintain the favour of these adults. So we try things on. And I don't mean this at all in a manipulative way because there's no consciousness around it. It's just what we are doing to try to survive. So you start to work out that obedience is something that keeps you in their favour, that keeps the peace, that means you get dessert, that whatever. Mm -hmm. So there's all these unconscious signals about behaviour that was rewarded. And it's where a huge amount of our personality comes from. It's we, we got feedback as little humans about what was pleasing to those adults and what wasn't. And some people feel like they can never win with their parents and so then they do the opposite and um and rebellious what we what we term as rebellious traits start to come through but for a lot of women who end up in the rushing woman camp they were raised to be good girls and so now as adults they still have the belief that love or i could say approval is essential to their survival but it's not Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the Running For A Podcast. I've been talking about Inside Tracker for quite a few years now. I love to get the Inside Tracker Ultimate Athlete Blood Test every few months, multiple times a year, just to check in on how my body is doing. I think that's very important, particularly with this year that we're going through. It is a time where we need to know how our body is doing to see that we're staying strong, staying healthy, what we are deficient in, particularly if it's vitamin D, we need to make sure we can take something to help us to keep those levels up. And you know what I would choose. I would choose Athletic Greens to help me bulk that up. But this is not about Athletic Greens. This is about Inside Tracker. And they are and they analyze your results. You'll see the various markers in your blood. There will be all kinds of things that you will learn about yourself. You can also see your inner age to see how your body is doing in terms of the health markers that you have. I am just a big fan of it. There's also great recommendations for once you do take your test. If you are deficient in this, you can eat this or you can find this. This is what you need. Uh, There's videos. It's very interactive. They are very friendly. They will set you up with a dietitian if you need some support. And it's just a great thing to have. And besides the fact, you will hear Dr. Libby in this episode mention about the importance of looking at your blood work. And if you are feeling a lot of the things that Libby is talking about in this episode, it is important that you get your blood work checked out. I only trust Inside Tracker. It is very simple, very easy and effective. They have been working with me for years to keep an eye on my nutrition and my health when I was an elite athlete. Now I'm a mother, not doing the best job. 
at getting in all the nutrients and supplements that I need. So they help me to see where I'm, where I'm missing out and then I can make a change and I can fix it. So I want to thank Inside Tracker for this. You can use code Tina Muir for 10% off your order. That's code Tina Muir for 10% off your order at InsideTracker.com. I have been a fan of this company for many years. And if you haven't been quite feeling quite yourself, you feel like something is off, particularly with all the stress you have in your life, or maybe what Dr. Libby was talking about, this is one of the first things she recommends. So thank you to Inside Tracker. Use code Tina Muir for 10% off your order at InsideTracker.com. For a lot of women who end up in the rushing woman camp, they were raised to be good girls. And so now as adults, they still have the belief that love, or I could say approval, is essential to their survival. But it's not because obviously as adults, we can get our own food and clothing and shelter. But until we examine this, the need for the approval of others will run our life. So it's lovely to be a good girl, but it's more important to be who you are. And sometimes when we speak our truth, it on the surface, it won't necessarily look like a good girl the way our parents might have defined it. But it is essentially good because it's our truth. <laughs> but it takes a lot of courage to make that shift to live authentically rather than be be good. So in a nutshell, it's very, very stressful for an individual when they have absolutely no flexibility in how they can handle other people seeing them. So sure, you can demonstrate truthfulness and goodness and all those things when that is truly what you want to be doing, but you can't live like that as if your life depends on it because you'll undo your health. What would be some of the 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 traits or things that people would do if if they are kind of subconsciously trying to keep that good girl image as an adult? Uh, I think it's different for everyone and it's often what pleased whoever raised us or one per, one of the people who raised us. So often when I was doing this one-on-one work with people, which I don't do the one-on-one work now, I've run online courses. Uh, I've got a nine week online course for women. And so I've, I've helped them pull all of this apart in, in that course. And I'll ask the question, whose love did you crave the most when you were growing up? So there's often one of our caregivers, you might've had some certainty around, uh, them or they were just always the same. They might've just always been in a bad mood. They weren't necessarily in a good place, but they were just always the same. And then there was another parent who was very changeable. And because we're egocentric when we're little, we think, as I said before, that that's because of us. And so we then try to change who we are to try to make them happy. And so quite often the good girl behaviours in adulthood will be the behaviours we tried to use to make that parent happy or a parent might have been suicidal or really depressed. And so you tried to be the biggest ray of sunshine on the planet because you felt so responsible to keep that person alive or to try to bring a smile to that person's face, Mm -hmm. whether it works or not. And so you still try to be that biggest ray of sunshine for absolutely everyone. So the good, good girl in inverted commas traits, they can be different for everyone, but they're often what we tried to employ to ensure our safety when we were, when we were little. Yeah. That's often what people who have divorced parents say, right? When they, they feel, they felt that the parents got divorced because, because of them, even though, you know, it, it's, it's never really to do with the children themselves, but that's how many children take it in is that they drove that divorce. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's heartbreaking because it's mm. not true, mm-hmm. um, but because of emotionally, from an emotional maturation perspective, we have no other way of seeing the world when we're really young. You, we, we honestly think that everything is because of us mm-hmm. and, but, but it's not conscious. You don't usually sit there and contemplate it <laughs> it's, um, it's not until we're older yeah. and have you know, different perspectives and, um, some more emotional maturity and our, our brain actually allows us to see things in other ways that you then can reflect and get some different insights. But yeah. It, it, it's heartbreaking at times. Yeah, for sure. And I, I want to go into now the question that people have probably been wondering this whole time we've been talking, which is, okay, 
all right, you got me. I'm a rushing woman. Uh, and I would encourage people, I'll put tons of links in the show notes, but go get this book. I am so glad I bought it and I'm going to keep reading it over and over again. But people want to hear, okay, what can I do here? And you, you have broken it down into all the different systems and and hormones in our body that are affected and people would love to hear what they can do to fix this although I find it very interesting that you said uh, that when you say to people they need to calm down as the first step essentially you've put here uh, when I explain to them that this panic this haste this urgency is what has to change first many stare at me blankly like I've asked them to repeat third grade algebra and then mm-hmm. you went on to say um, that when you ask them to do that, that means I'll get less done in a day and you clearly don't understand the pressure I'm under. I think that's what many people listening will be thinking. So t- give us a pitch on why calming calming down would work and what is meant by kind of calming down in terms of someone who is a rushing woman. Okay. Can I t- in t- I'll round back to that, Tina, if that's yes. okay? Because um, I just want to finish up that comment about children of divorced parents before yeah, sure, I go yeah, into the car. Yep, yep. Just because the last thing I ever want is for anyone to feel guilty because of a statement. So I think it's incredibly important that, so when I said it can be heartbreaking because a lot of children realise once they're adults that they blame themselves for mm-hmm. that and then they come to know that they weren't responsible for that. I think it's I personally have a belief that ever that what happens in life happens for us, not to us. Yeah, and that and I mean that even with the genuinely really tough stuff. And so when you've gone through something traumatic, truly traumatic, or when you you know you think, oh my goodness, I felt responsible for my parents' divorce, uh, or you might be an adult listening to this and you're going to get divorced or you are divorced and that, and you're really worried about the effects on children. Mm-hmm. Just remember that we never want to witness people. We love experiencing pain, but it is from our suffering. It is from pain that we grow. Yeah. We don't, we don't grow and learn in any other way. So I just wanted to clarify that yeah, because thank it's, you. I believe it's all for us. Life is happening for us, not to us. Yeah. That shows your heart and lo- and care there by you circling back to that, like that it bothered you to to leave it at that. So thank you. Mm. So now to the calm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so it's not easy, absolutely. But the reason that starting to create moments of calm for ourselves, the reason that's so important is because it starts to shift our perspective and it's a little bit along the lines of what I said earlier. It doesn't change what we do in a day. It doesn't change what we're responsible for. It doesn't change all of the tasks that need doing, but it changes the way we are able to show up for those tasks, for those people being in the presence of those people. Because so when we create moments of spaciousness, when we, it might be that we commit to doing 20 long, slow breaths, Uh, while the kettle boils in the morning instead of running around and doing 50,000 other jobs. It might be that any time we're stuck at red traffic lights, we breathe diaphragmatically because breathing diaphragmatically activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the calm arm of the nervous system. So you commit to some kind of breath focus practice or a breath focus ritual to start to create these moments of calm. And then you start to notice that the back-to-back tasks and what what once felt like an overwhelming schedule, now you start to connect more to, oh, I don't have to do this, I get to do this. So you catch glimpses of the privilege of, I, I know kids are being homeschooled in a lot of places around the world at the moment, but uh, an example I will commonly use, sometimes it will stand there packing school lunches and what's going on in our head is, oh, I have to do this. And then I, after I finish packing the school lunches, then I have to do that. And it's all I have to. And we can flip things in if we have those moments of spaciousness and we've got a little ounce of calm starting to come through from how we're breathing or, or shifting our perceptions. And you think, oh, I get to do this. And I can remember one of my dearest girlfriends, she has three children and uh, she has been packing school lunches for 18 years. And she said to me, I always blame the school lunches for making me late. 
she said, you would think that in 18 years I would have learned to start doing it earlier or I could have done it the night before, but no, I still do them on the morning before school and I have always said the school lunches make me run late. And she said, and I'm standing there one day going, oh, I have to do this, these stupid lunches and blah, blah. And then she said, and then it dawned on me that my eldest would be going away to university uh, the following year and she'd be standing there packing two lunches (laughs) instead of three. And then she realised how much she was going to miss her eldest son when he left. And she said, and so then I'm standing in the kitchen with tears running down my face fully reconnecting to how grateful I am to be their mother and to be packing their lunches. And so I don't want to be all Pollyanna about this and, you know, paint a picture like, oh, you know, just flip your thinking from I have to do this to I get to do this. I'm not saying it's that simple, but when we create these, when we create rituals in our life that foster calm, whatever that is, the breath, the breathing practices, uh, making sleep a priority and getting more sleep in, in your storage banks so that you can, when things go awry in the day, instead of reacting with intensity, you can see it for how it is and go, okay, that's not what was scheduled. That's not what I was expecting, but okay, we're just going to go with this rather than sort of going into that overwhelmed, oh my goodness, this is, this feels like the end of the world, blah, blah. So the calm, when we start to embrace just moments of calm, little rituals across our day, it just starts to change how we're able to handle things and the way we approach things. Yes. Thank you so much. I've actually found, uh, I've heard this mentioned before, um, but I found that when I brush my teeth in the morning now, I really try and just stand still and brush my teeth rather than trying to do six different things, not brushing my teeth as well as I should be brushing them because I'm, you know, trying to like bend down and tie my shoe (laughs) and not, I I couldn't do that, but you know what I mean? Like something that is, you're trying to get done. Instead, I kind of stand and look at myself in the mirror, just take a moment to like, look at myself. And, and I I've really kind of been enjoying doing that because I can feel the toothbrush on my teeth. I can make sure I get all the, get it, you know, exactly how I want to hopefully prevent cavities. And then just being able to look at myself for a minute and, and, and appreciate that. So, um, that's one little thing that I've been trying to do lately and that I've, I've found very helpful. And I, I like that you said starting small with little nuggets and, and in the book you explain, you know, how, how to do that and, and, and resources to help. And you also, I just want to mention quickly, uh, you mentioned, um, about getting blood work. So if someone is feeling that this is everything we've talked about has applied, but they want to get a starting point for where, where they are at to see where their cortisol levels are, to see, um, where many of their hormones are, their sex hormones might be at to tell if it is affecting their body. Why is it that blood work is, is going to be helpful to kind of give, or do you think blood work is a good starting point before someone begins this journey of kind of pulling themselves away so they can get a snapshot afterwards? So blood tests can be, can obviously offer some great insight. Not everybody needs them, not at all. And sometimes, uh, you know, you you can arm yourself with some information and make changes on your own. Other people very much prefer to work with a health professional and and some people really like to see things on paper. So they like to see their blood tests and then they like to have things retested three months later Mm -hmm. after they've made some changes and actually see the change occurring in their blood. So it really depends on the personality and what they prefer. And sometimes it depends on how unwell someone actually is. Okay. So absolutely testing. Um, so cortisol levels change over the day. They're supposed to be nice and high in the morning and nice and low in the evening. So, uh, you can do saliva testing across the day to see your cortisol profile, or that might not be an option. You can do just a first, an 8am cortisol blood test, and that will at least show you how your cortisol is first thing in the morning, which can be making a difference to the energy you have when you get out of bed, the Mm. level of vitality you feel. Iron is another thing that's very worthwhile testing in the rushing woman type population because uh, 25 to 30% of women across the menstruation years, uh, certainly in Australia and New Zealand, are iron deficient. It's a, it's the most common nutritional deficiency in the world and it's responsible for the transportation of oxygen through our body. So it's hugely linked, obviously, to energy, uh, to what's happening with our menstrual cycle. And particularly uh, for runners as well. Exactly. Yeah. So iron is a really worthwhile test uh, 
so can zinc be. I'm always curious to test thyroid function. Mm. Uh, if you test your sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, etc., you need to ideally do that on day 21 of your menstrual cycle if you have a 28-day cycle. So you, you test sex hormones seven days before you typically menstruate mm. because that's your progesterone is supposed to be nice and high uh, seven days after ovulation. So uh, blood tests can offer uh, great insight for some people. Not everybody needs them, though. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right. Anything else you would add for someone, obviously, to go get Rushing Woman's Syndrome or and check out the other books that you have on your website, which I will put lots of links in the show notes to. But anything else you would like to tell people listening who maybe have been hearing a lot of what we've said today and thought, oh, wow. Yeah, I this all spoke to me. <laughs> So, oh, thank you, Tina. So I'm actually doing, so I wrote the book back in 2011 and it's, uh, never, it, it's just amazed me how it's kept really connecting with people. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I love it when, when, when people find it and it really <laughs> rings true to them. So, yeah. and we, and obviously with all the changes going on in the world at the moment, uh, we've been getting emails every day from people saying, you know, can you do a course about rushing? I've, I've got an, a nine week online course yeah. for women. Okay. Uh, that will be the next one of those starts on the 5th of October. But I'm at, we've had so many requests for the rushing woman type information. I'm actually doing just a one hour online live event uh, for that a little bit later in October. Um, so you can read about that on my website, which is drlibby.com. But the, I guess the final thing I would say is I think we often think that the opposite of stress is calm. And over the years, I've really come to see that it's not. The opposite of stress, I think, is trust. Mm. And we forget to trust and we forget to trust in the unfolding of life. And sometimes it's incredibly painful and it's incredibly challenging. But at the same time, even when it's really painful and really challenging, it is also so incredibly beautiful and such a ridiculous gift. And I think if we can stay somehow in touch with our ability to trust the unfolding of it all, that too can really help to foster calm. <laughs> I love that. Yes. Thank you so much. What a great way to, to finish it here. Uh, so where would you prefer people come find you on the website, on your social media? Where, where was, where's the best place oh, for them to go learn? Wherever the, wherever the information is for them. So my website is drlibby.com. There's plenty of blog posts there about, you know, sex hormones and all the, all the things I talk about. Uh, and on Instagram, I'm Dr. Libby. It looks like dribbly, but it's just D-R-L-I-B-B-Y. <laughs> uh, and Facebook is Dr. Libby Live. But yeah, there's information in all of those, all of those places. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you and all that you have done and look forward to hearing what many of my listeners find once they, they read this and, and really kind of allow it to help them change their lives. So thank you. Oh, Tina, I appreciate everything you're doing and the difference you're making in, in people's lives, helping them come back to, you talked about it at the beginning, really listening to their body and trusting that mm -hmm. and trusting in that again. So thank you. Thank you. So important. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, EA, iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast or if you would subscribe to this podcast you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better it might not seem like you as one person can make a difference but really it helps a lot and it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those thank you so much so thankful to Dr. Libby for coming on the show to talk to us. I was actually amazed that she said yes, to be honest. She has a ton of things that she does in her life. She has a massive following. I wasn't expecting a reply, let alone to have her an hour of her time. So I hope you enjoyed that one as much as I did. I really did enjoy it. You can find links in the show notes by going to tinamuir.com forward slash episode 212. And on that note, at the beginning, I mentioned this briefly, you heard Libby talking about a live education thing that she is doing. That's actually already happened as of the day that you are hearing this. There is going to be more on her website to explain where you can go to watch previous things that she's done and what upcoming things she has now uh, coming up in November and beyond. So be sure to go to the links in the show notes, tinamuir.com forward slash episode 212. I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Momentus, Tracksmith and Inside Tracker. You can use code 
Tina15 for $15 off your purchase of 75 or more at tracksmith.com. You can also get 10% off at Inside Tracker. This is detailed blood work. If you're confused with something that's going on, if you want to check in on how your body is doing, you can check it out and use code Tina Muir for 10% off at insidetracker.com. That's Tina Muir for 10% off at insidetracker.com. And finally, I want to mention about Momentus. I've been telling you about them the last few weeks and I've really been enjoying the products myself, particularly the collagen and the creatine. You can use code TINA to get 15% off your first subscription at livemomentous.com. That's 15% off using code TINA at livemomentous.com. Now, next week we have a very special episode. Another guest I did not expect to get. This guest, I only have him because of how early I asked for this episode. Have you watched Down to Earth on Netflix yet? If not, go watch it. That's your homework this week. I have Darren Olean on the show next week, and I could not be more excited for you to hear this conversation. Go listen up to Down to Earth with Zach Efron and Darren Olean on Netflix, and I will see you next Friday. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out TinaMuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.